Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Earlier this month, on July 11th, billionaire Richard Branson became the very first person to blast off into space using his own money and his own private spaceship. Not to be outdone, just a week later, billionaire, trillionaire, whatever you know, Jeff Bezos followed suit and became the second person to blast off into space in his own privately funded personal spaceship. When Jeff Bezos landed on the ground, of course, the reporters were there, and the very first words he said when he got out of his spaceship were, best day ever. These days, the 11th and the 20th, will go down in history because Branson and Bezos were the first people to go in their private, personal spacecraft. Not because they were the first citizens or first private businessmen in space. They certainly weren't. If the era of commercial space flight had a first, if it had a birthday, it would be April 28th, 2001. On that date, the American businessman Dennis Tito became history's first space tourist. Paying his own way, on a Russian spacecraft up to the International Space Station, Tito, 40 years to the month after Yuri Gagarin became the first person in space, proved that there was money to be made in commercial space flight. He mainly showed that by paying $2 million for his ticket to get up to the International Space Station. Similar to the sentiments that Branson and Bezos shared when they landed, Here's what Dennis Tito said when he landed. My dream was to fly in space before I die. The thing I have taken away from it is a sense of completeness for my life, that everything else I would do in my life would be a bonus. Now, I've never been to space, willing to say I probably won't be, and I'm sure it is an exhilarating, memorable, and exciting experience in your life. But to say that a single trip to space would make a person's life complete, I think only reveals what a very small understanding of life you have is. The, the small meaning of life that you perceive to be if that single trip to space completes all of it. Dennis Tito said flying into space made his life complete. Jeff Bezos said it was the best day of his life ever. Jeff Bezos has three children. I don't know about his own personal convictions, but I would like to ask him, that day was better than any one of the three days God let you participate in his miracle of life? That day that you got to look back on his creation was better than the day he gave you life? If I could talk to Mr. Dennis Tito, I would like to ask him that if you think that being in space completes your life, could you imagine how much more complete it would be if you've got to meet and know and have a relationship with the one who made all that that you're looking at? Don't you think that would complete your life? Whether you're a billionaire or struggling to make ends meet, living paycheck to paycheck, all of us in our sinfulness as a humanity have a tendency to desire the gift rather than the giver. In our sinfulness by nature, we tend to seek satisfaction from the good things rather than from the goodness of the one God who gives all things and who by definition has to be greater than the good things that he's able to give. As the Bible says in James chapter 1, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God's goodness never changes. And human sinfulness never changes either. In John chapter 6, 
We see crowds of people chasing after Jesus, the crowds that were miraculously fed by him with only five loaves and two fish are now chasing after Jesus. He had fed them, and then because they wanted to try and force him to be their king, he dismissed his disciples, and he separated himself to go up on a mountain to pray. That night, Jesus walks on water out to his disciples, and then the next morning, the crowd back on the other side wakes up. It's breakfast time. Where's Jesus? Well, they can't find him. So they get into boats, and they cross over to go to Jesus' hometown in Capernaum, trying to find him. And they eventually do catch up to him. And they ask him in verse 25, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now, from all outward appearances, these are followers of Jesus. They aren't just followers in thought. They have gone to a great effort to go find the one they call Rabbi. They are following Jesus. But Jesus sees the truth of men's hearts. As he so often does, Jesus won't give them the answer to the question they ask. He will give them the answer to the question they should have asked, the answer that they need. He says to them in verse 26, truly I I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Now Jesus is doing something he does quite often and that I believe he very much continues to do today. He is making his hearers think about why they're following him. Why do you call him teacher? Why do you call him Lord? Why do you follow Jesus? It's a question that reminds me of something Jesus asked his disciples at the beginning of John those first two disciples who were first disciples of John the Baptist. John recounted in chapter one that John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus and as Jesus walked by, John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God. John's two disciples heard him say this and they started following Jesus instead. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, what are you seeking? Why are you following me? Now with these great crowds having chased Jesus across the Sea of Galilee, Jesus turns to them and confronts them with the same question. Except this time the question is assumed in what Jesus tells them plainly. You are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. I imagine it must have been a very penetrating question when those two disciples of John the Baptist first started following Jesus, and he turned around, and the first question he asked him is, why are you following me? I imagine it was penetrating in the hearts of the crowds that day, who went to a lot of effort, by the way, to follow Jesus. And then he tells them the truth about why they're following him. And it should be a penetrating question for you and I today who follow Jesus, who call him Lord and teacher. It should be a penetrating question when he asks us, Why are you following me? What are you seeking? What are you working for? So, if Jesus was here right now, how would you answer that question? You go to work every day? You do a whole lot of stuff every day? What are you doing it all for? What's the first thing that goes through your head when you wake up in the morning? All your time, effort, energy, talents, treasure, what are you working for? 
What are you looking for? Jesus tells the crowd that day, you are seeking me, but not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And that implies that they should have been seeking him because of the sign, not the bread. You see, the sign, just like a stop sign on the road today, isn't there to say, hi, I'm a sign. No, the stop sign is to point to something bigger beyond it. That's what Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 should have done. It should have pointed to who he is, not what he could do for them. Same with our blessings. The blessing of time you have. Treasure you have. All the blessings that God has given. All the true miracles that you can hold in your hand. Your children, your family, your work, your job. Those are signs. Not to point to more signs but to point to him. To chase after or to seek after the bread, the blessing, rather than to seek after the one who gives the blessing is to deprive yourself of the very thing you're looking for. Here's the point I think that Jesus is making that we often forget and that certainly doesn't go over well today in the general Christian culture. Jesus did not come to fill your stomach with bread or your bank account with money and he didn't come to take away every illness. He didn't come to make life more comfortable. What he came to do was to give you life, his life, so that you could live because there is no life, there is no satisfaction apart from Jesus. That's what the bread points to. You're in a desolate place, you have nothing. Hi, I can give you bread. Jesus didn't come to give us bread, so don't look for bread. Otherwise, you'll miss him. Even good things can be elevated too high. Even the blessing God's, blessings that God gives us can be lifted up to the point where they make us blind to see the bigger blessing of life he wants to give us. That's, what, that's the whole reason Jesus had to go across the sea, right? They had their stomachs filled and they were gonna make Jesus their king by force. So Jesus had to leave. The best day ever? Well, every day can be a best day in space or here on earth when you know the one who made it all. When you have a relationship with the one who has come to you to reveal who he is. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter six. Don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? I consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The crowds came seeking from Jesus something that was never going to satisfy them. So Jesus tells them, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? You see, they missed it. That's the whole reason they were chasing Jesus across the sea. They, 
They were trying to go and get something more from Jesus. They were chasing him because they didn't realize what they already had been given in him. No different than the disciples, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water. So Jesus answered the crowd and said very simply, this is the work of God. And don't miss that either. They asked, what must we be doing to do the works of God? And Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. If we want to be truly satisfied in life, we should be working to receive all of what we have already been given, not working to get more of what we think we need. And we have been given everything in the blood of Christ. Grace, forgiveness, the presence of God himself, So they say to Jesus, what? Work for the bread that doesn't perish. And they say, give us this bread always. To be satisfied means to be content and not need anything else. To be satisfied, by definition, means to need and want nothing else because what you have is completely sufficient. And Jesus is calling those crowds and his disciples and you and I to realize that what he has already given us in himself is more than enough. The best way to be grateful is to be satisfied with Jesus. To bring him all that you even don't have. That's what he called the disciples to do at the feeding of the 5,000. John tells us he knew they weren't going to be able to feed these people. So Jesus says what? Go feed these people. Bring me everything you don't have and give it to me. Jesus tells them plainly, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. In other words, you'll be satisfied. What does it mean to be satisfied by Jesus and live a satisfied life. It means to certainly thank God for the blessings that he has given you and then to thank him for everything that he has withheld from you. To be truly satisfied means to pray to God who's with you and say thank you for these answers to prayer and Lord thank you for not answering these prayers. It means to worship him because of who he is, not what he can do for you. Because he's already done it all for you. You already have it all in Christ. That's what we do when we come to this table. We come here not to be filled in our flesh, but to once again be completely satisfied as we meet with our Lord and hear his words again for the forgiveness of of your sins. As Jesus says in verse 51, later in chapter 6, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The good things and the blessings that we receive from our gracious God in this life are signs that should point and lead us beyond the blessings to the one who blesses, both in what he gives and in what he takes away. The manna dropped down from heaven in the wilderness, though it was miraculous bread, did not stop the Israelites from dying. What saved God's people back then is the same thing that saves them today. It is faith in the one to whom the bread pointed. Faith in the one who had his body broken. That bread of life that is his flesh. Buried and rise again on the third day. Because that's the satisfaction our souls need. 
What does it mean to have a life of satisfaction? What does that look like? It looks like Jesus. Jesus who taught us to pray for and showed us what it means to hallow the name of God by receiving daily bread. Being satisfied not with the blessings, but with the one who provides the good good things in our life. When you think about it, the Lord we worship owned nothing his whole life. Not one possession. The only thing he did have at the time of his death was taken off of him and gambled away. And yet he was perfectly faithful to the end. Do you, have, do you know how satisfied you have to be to be able to do what he did for you? That's what Jesus offers us in himself. So no matter what tomorrow brings, that's what true faith in Christ promises. Contentment in every circumstance, even in death. Because for all who believe in Christ, we have already been satisfied with the eternal life that has already been given to you in him. Amen.